This is a podcast by The Straits Times. If you got in an accident with someone, let's say someone hit you, and you've done your reporting, you're trying to claim against the other party, but then a couple of weeks later, you get an email saying, hey, the insurer tells you, my insured did not do the reporting. So, hey, tough luck. We're not, we're not going to entertain or we're not going to be activated. So please go and sue him yourself. The insurance company will say, you have to go after him yourself. Now, this is also a tricky part because look, usually in such cases, maybe the damage to your car is $2,000. And uh, are you really going to hire a, a lawyer? lawyer yeah. And you know, the time, the effort, and maybe pay $5,000 to go after the guy. So most times you just say, look, uh, forget about it. Um, I'll just claim my own insurance. So you claim OD. So you make a claim on your own insurance. Uh, under normal circumstances, again, it affects your insurance. So anytime you make your own claim, you lose your NCD, there's a uh, possibility of premium loading. But however, if you can prove to your insurer that it's not your fault, but it's really out of uh, 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 no recourse, many a times, again, you can be negotiated with the insurer not to penalise your NCD and not to increase your premium on renewal. You're listening to COE Watch, a podcast by The Straits Times. I'm Lee Nian Zhou and I cover transport news and motoring trends. COE is short for Certificate of Entitlement. With some exceptions, all types of motor vehicles must have a COE to be registered. On this episode, we're going to talk about something that every type of vehicle needs, motor insurance. Are you wondering why motor insurance premium keep rising, even when you have not made a claim? Join me in my chat with Mr. Douglas Chia, the Chief Executive of Easy and Insurance Broker. Hello, Douglas. Tell us a bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Joe. My name is Douglas, and I'm the CEO of Easy. We're an insurance broker that specialises in motor insurance. As an insurance broker, we represent the interests of the customer, sourcing for multiple insurance quotes for the customer uh, across various insurance companies. Great. So we really love acronyms on COU Watch. So tell me this, NCD, short for No Claims Discount. What does this actually do for the vehicle owner? Well, the No Claims Discount, or NCD for short, is an incentive system for customers. So for every year of no claims on your car, if you do not make uh, submit a claim, you accrue 10% discount off your premium. This max out at 50% over five years. So you have no claims over five years, you have 50% discount on your insurance premium. It's an incentive system, but they also penalize you at any point of time that you have an accident. So say anytime in between, if you would have had an accident, it will minus 30% of your discount. So if you had 50, and after five years, or there's a six or seven year, which you are maxed out at 50 already, you had an accident, you will get minus 30 and be left with 20. But any point of time, if you are less than 30%, you will be flawed at zero. You will not, your NCD will not go to negative. I see, I see. So the first haircut is 30%. If I make another claim, I will, I'll get zero. That's right. Won't get negative. You will not get negative. Okay, that's, that's assuring to know for some of the more accident-prone drivers out there. But I want to find out something else is that we talk about this cost of your annual insurance premium, right? Mm-hmm. It seems that insurance premium just keep going up. Like, what, what, are, what are motorists doing wrong? Or, or why do insurance companies think that they can take more and more money from us? Well, I think it's not that insurance company wants to take more and more from you guys. Inflation is a big keyword among, I think, all businesses these days. And inflation affects all our lives in every aspect. Well, one thing is labour and parts costs. So labour cost has been going up. Labour is difficult to get for most businesses these days. And parts, the raw material cost that goes into making of the parts for the vehicles are increasing at an exponential rate. So these two added together actually inflates repair costs. The repair of a vehicle these days are significantly more expensive than before. One other factor is shipping. Uh, Supply chain has been greatly disrupted since COVID. This has pushed up shipping costs too, because as made famous by Toyota, most manufacturers are practicing just in time. They will only order the parts when it's required. This has worked very well for many manufacturers where um, they're able to keep costs low by not having parts, the the no need for storage or rent. But this has uh, came back to bite them in the current environment. So those, these two factors, uh, inflation and increase in shipping costs, has resulted in uh, insurance premium going up. Another thing that I always get asked by customers, which I, I, I don't know whether this is intuitive for many of you, they always ask me, I'm on the third or the fourth year of my insurance. Why isn't my premium going down? The value of my car is going down. Um, I pose this to you, Nimjo. Have you thought about it this way? If you have a new toy, how will you treat that new toy? 
So let's say you have a new iPhone, right? Um, would you buy a nice little case and screen protector for it? I do it for my iPhone until it dies. Well, then, then let me ask you one thing. How often do you drop your iPhone in the first year? Oh, I see where you're getting at. Yeah, I mean, when it's a different shape and all that, sometimes I'm a little, even though I try to be careful, I might have a mishap. No, the point I was getting to is you would treat it with care on the first couple of years. Now, if you buy a new car, which is going to cost you a couple of hundred thousand dollars, in the first two years, you're going to be washing it every other day, polishing it, driving it with cab, and it's still shiny and stuff. The electronics are all new. But towards the fourth, fifth, and sixth year, you know, as it get, the colors get duller, the electronics get older, the care for it tends to decrease. It's human nature. So, I mean, from an actual perspective, the accident rates of older cars are higher than newer cars. I'm not sure if that makes intuitive sense to you. Okay, and then this also comes to mind the fact that an old vehicle get an accident, usually there's another vehicle on the other side, right? Yes. In other words, what you're telling me is that the, the, the insurance policy will then have to be able to cover or compensate the, any damage or repairs to the other party who might be a newer car. Yes. Is, is that also part of the calculation? Oh, of course. I mean, again, contrary to popular belief, insurance should be tagged solely on the value of your car. It's not. Because when you buy a comprehensive insurance policy, which majority of the people buy, just to share, the, the minimum coverage in Singapore for motor insurance is third party only. Mm. So for the other person that you hit? Yes, and not your car itself. This is the base requirement. However, for cars with financing, you're not allowed to take third party only. You have to take comprehensive because the bank has an interest in the car. They want that car interest to be protected. Now, in a comprehensive car insurance, there's a component of the own damage to the car itself and the third party risk. Now, the own damage component to your car can depreciate over time as the re repair cost of your car depreci uh, depreci as depreciates with time. Yeah. However, the third party coverage never changes. It's static. But the other component I wanted to introduce was your propensity to have an accident increases slightly as the age of your car decreases. I see, I see. Okay, I've never thought of it that way. But I want to find out the other thing is that now I'm asking for a friend. Mm. Um, what kind of, how does the actuaries or the calculation of this policy in terms of the annual premium, how do they differentiate? Is Do they differentiate by gender, by age, types of jobs you do, your, I don't know, what kind of background? How How is it kind of worked out before you, you throw into the machine, it comes out this number, you got to pay me this much for this comprehensive uh, insurance coverage? Just like you mentioned, there are two main criteria. One is the profile of the individual. So that's what you just mentioned. And the other one is the type of car you're buying. Let's talk about the, discuss about the first one you're mentioning. Uh, might get a little bit controversial, but uh, a couple of things we look at are age, gender, occupation, age. The obvious one is the younger you are, the higher risk you are. So the sweet spot for most insurers is 27 to 65. Outside of 27 to 65, there are a little bit of, um, I wouldn't call it penalty, but loading on the premium. So let's go on the easier one first. Above 65, you know, as with age, your reflexes might be slower. But that's offset by the fact that as you age, you're more kiasi. You drive safer. So that, that's not that bad. I think the above 65, it's uh, manageable. You know, there's a little bit of an increase, but that's fine. But below 27, or some insurers um, treat it below 24, that premium starts going up very fast. Now, the reason being, you know, think about this, how were you like when you were 18 or 19 when you first got your license? Slightly less wise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I was extremely not unwise, <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, you think you're king of the world, you have a license, you can get behind a fast-moving vehicle, you can impress the girls, you know, you can go out, you can go to places, you can put your, your leg on the pedal and be behind a lot of power. And, you know, maturity is something that just comes with age, you know, as you acquire life experiences. Uh, so accident rates for 18, 19, 20, all the, so 18 to 21, it's usually difficult for people to get car insurance or insurance costs will be exorbitant. Mm. So age is one of the factors. Okay. Another factor is uh, gender. Oh, this okay. Let's uh, go. Let's um, go. You look worried, but... <laughs> I look worried. I, I don't know how many lawsuits I'm going to get uh, after this. So now I, I'm going to state what is... Um, uh, yeah, by the book, by the book. By the book. Let's right? go by don't, the book. Don't, don't quote. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't. Don't add to it. Yeah. yeah. So um, to balance this off, male unmarried is more expensive. Male 
married is cheaper. The, the, the theory obviously is when you are married, you, okay. are, you take risk more. Okay. When you're married, you settle down, you have a ca- family to care for, you're a safer driver. However, interestingly enough, it's the reverse for female. For female, if you're unmarried, it is actually cheaper. But if you're married, it is more expensive. Wow. Now, this is oh, the okay. part yeah. where... Please explain, please explain. <laughs> just to save your skin, I, actually. <laughs> the theory is, if you were a married female, you would have duties to take care of in the household. You're running errands. You're fetching the kids to and fro. As do a married male. Uh, <laughs> maybe nowadays, males are, are, are having to pull their weight more, but I think traditionally. Okay. Uh, uh, statistically, from an actual science perspective, yes. uh, uh, there are, I wouldn't like to say that there are, you know, evidence uh, or statistical evidence proving, but there is the perception that as a female, married, uh, uh, you are running around, ferrying the kids, uh, doing the... More hectic. More there are certain oh, obligations, rush. rush that you have to get to, which um, might result in more accidents. So again, this is not from me. Okay. I mean, if you say so. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, this is of course coming from your track record of handling so many, uh, uh, helping so many customers to get their policies and, and what have you, right? Yep. The last part, I think, uh, uh, one other point was the occupation. Yes. Yes, of course, um, if you were a, a salesperson running around, you know, going from Tuas, to Tampanese, um, uh, with so a driving mark. is part of your work. Yes, driving. Uh, as a salesperson, right, you have to commute from point to yeah. point. Um, not 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 driving as like a private hire driver, but the nature of your work just requires to visit lots of customers. Mm. So you have to drive high mileage as opposed to a desk bound job. The risk would be lower. As to the color of a car, um, we have never asked for the color of any okay. of our customers' yeah. car. Now we moved into the profile of the vehicle that we are going to get insurance for, right? Yeah. So, yeah, we end off with the, the, the individual. We, we, we talked about marital status, occupation, age, and gender. Yes. Now, the next part of the equation is the profile of the vehicle. So, th- again, the profile of the vehicle, a few factors. The brand. Now, different brands would have different premiums, and there's a reason why. A couple of the reasons is volume. So, high, high circulation volume vehicles would tend to have a cheaper premium. Insurance is all about risk pooling. So yes. the more numbers of sales that you have means I can collect more premium. So I could then buffer against the ah, risk. Okay. So usually you, you, you take, for example, um, Toyota uh, with a high, or a Mercedes with high uh, uh, population. A popular model. Popular model yeah. with a high population. I can collect more premiums. Mm. I can buffer. Now, um, lower circulation like Alfa Romeo. Uh, I, you know, even if I collect a hundred cases, right? One big accident can wipe out everything. So I need a higher premium per case. So it's a volume game. Insurance is all about volume. Sales volume of the vehicle plays a large part. The second is uh, demographics of the drivers. Um, I give a very obvious example. Take BMW versus Mercedes. Um, They both sell about the same volume in Singapore. Uh, They're both very high circulation volume. However, BMW always portray itself as a young, sportier, trendier brand vis-a-vis Mercedes, which is a more stable, um, nothing wrong with either, but it's just the way they portray themselves, more stable, executive, mature, and then versus young, sportier. So there is that perception that people who buy a BMW would like to... Be a certain kind. Be a certain kind or or like to maybe um, accelerate on the pedal a little bit more, right? Uh, uh, Likes to drive more uh, of it, whereas... The BMW crowd will be, okay, I just like the interior to be... Uh, the Mercedes crowd, you mean? Yeah, Mercedes crowd to be luxurious. I'm happy, I'm comfortable. The BMW crowd would like to push the performance. Though. So hang on here. You are saying that this is the perception of who is in the car or is it the kind of people they attract towards the car? The kind of people they attract towards the car. Because of the brand positioning, the kind of people they attract towards the car will naturally attract these people to buy those cars and they will drive those cars mm. that way. Okay, I so see. So then... That then leads to the next point, which is the records of the accident rate. So if a certain brand historically has higher accident rates, the insurance premium will be higher. Now, an obvious case would be your JDMs. So Mm. a lot of your JDMs, like your Evos. So these will be the Japanese domestic models, the cool, quirky cars. Yes. Okay. So 
take for example your Nissan GTRs, your Evolution, not Evo quirky, 10. just monsters. Yes, monsters. Great sports cars. Subaru Rex. Yeah. Right. These ones have obscene insurance rates because um, the demographics of the people who buy such cars buy them for a specific reason. Uh, I'd like to say for the sound system. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they buy a boss sound systems in there, and then they will just park it in the perfect parking lot and listen to the music all day long. Yes. No, but so on on top of this perception and the records of how these vehicles are used, it's also to do with the sort of claims that they will make, right? I mean, a a, a five hundred horsepower, highly modified Japanese car will probably get in a bigger accident than a small car driven by an older person, a more matured or married otherwise, whichever is. Yes. So there's two other factors that I want to mention, which was the horsepower of the car and the, the value of the car. So the horsepower of the car, yes. As we mentioned earlier, the motor insurance co policy covers third-party risks, right? the, at a bare minimum, which is a regulatory requirement by the government. So the higher the horsepower it has, the more damage it can cause. Mm, not the, just to, to the third party. To the third party. Be it a car, a building, or a human being. So the resulting casualty might be more severe, which is why it will garner a, a, a command a higher premium. Likewise, a higher value car, think of a Rolls Royce that's worth, uh, a brand new Rolls Royce these days would be worth about $2 million. Uh, and I will just share, um, the bumper on the Rolls Royce just to replace, it's enough to buy you a brand new Toyota. This is one bumper or one bumper. So usually <laughs> you bang the front. You don't bang the front and the back. So uh, 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 the bumper of, I think, uh, uh, a Rolls Royce Phantom. Mm. So Phantom would be the flagship, right? The big sedan, the, the limousine, of course. The big yeah. limousine. Yeah. Yes. The bu the front bumper of Rolls Royce to replace is about the price of a Mercedes CLA 180. Okay, but I happen to know a guy around the corner who can just hammer it back. This is something I want to ask. We've come to insurance claims and the value of insurance, right? Now, you say that a uh, front bumper costs as much as a Mercedes. What if it was the option that some guy says, you know, I could, I could fix it on the cheap. I could mend it on the cheap. Then I think the policies that will help you to say, I am brand me cheap. I want it done. I just want to meet the minimum requirement of the law and the, 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 the bank who is financing this. Are there such products available? So we, we move on to another uh, topic, which is um, one of the ways to get a cheaper insurance premium. So I think this is a very uh, important option when choosing, when buying insurance. Let's say your coverage is comprehensive. So the question that many times you get asked is, do you want an any workshop or authorized workshop? Ah, yes. So now this is a topic uh, which is quite contentious actually. So many people who buy a new car from their car man, uh, distributor for let's say the authorized dealer, they would always be, um, there will always be a bundle insurance which you have to buy. Now, usually this insurance makes you go back to, to the dealer for repair. Now, there's nothing wrong in that per se, but as you mentioned uh, earlier, the repairs tend to be a little bit more expensive. Replace versus repair. Not just replace versus repair. The, the labor rate is higher and the parts costs are higher because they are the authorized dealer. I mean, in, what, in, in that regard, is they are set up are more uh, robust. You know, they have, they have heavy, heavier sunk costs. You know, their they the infrastructure is, is larger, they, they have uh, more equipment and higher overheads that they have to cover. So nothing wrong in that. So their charges are a little bit higher. Now, on your renewal or certain consumers who are not bounded to buy the, the official, the official policies, insurance, yeah. when, they, when they source around for their in, own insurance policy, one option they can look at is an authorized workshop plan. Now, what is an authorized workshop plan? When you buy an authorized workshop plan instead of any workshop plan, that means that when you had an accident and you are repairing your own damage, that means re uh, damage to your own car, you must go to a panel of workshop that is uh, selected by the insurer. Usually for the larger insurers, um, the, the, big, the big three biggest insurers in Singapore being Income, AIG and Allianz, they have on average, about 20 to 30 panel workshops uh, on their list. And this spreads out of north, south, east, west uh, in Singapore. So it's quite accessible. Uh, and I want to clarify that to get on this panel, it's a very robust selection system. They, they have to be invented. They, the insurance company are also very cautious about their brand image. So to get on this panel, you're not a fly-by-night shop. You're actually a very proper, decent shop. Pro proper in terms of reputation. You've been around reputation, for a while. Usually the repairs done by a panel workshop of insurer will give you a warranty. 
Sometimes it's one year to three years. Some of them even give you lifetime warranties, right? So it's very, very robust. And the other thing is you do not have to worry about your warranty being voided if you, are, if you go outside. Because in 2018, the Competition Commission of Singapore has already came out and said that dealers are not allowed to void the warranty of a person's uh, vehicle if they go to the outside workshop. Mm, so this is the warranty as in, like, say I have a, uh, my car, I've, I've got a Toyota or whatever it is that Toyota distributor cannot void my warranty. If I had an accident, it was repaired by a panel workshop. Yes. So they, they, are, no, they are no longer allowed okay. to void the warranty. They used to, but since 2018, they are no longer allowed to do that. So by choosing an authorized workshop plan, usually your insurance premium can be about 20% lower. And uh, the quality of the work done by this authorized workshop are, are actually very good. Uh, I would say comparable. I mean, they are cheaper because they are bounded by the insurance rules where they have to they have to they charge fixed rates for certain things yeah. that they do. I see. Then I've, I have more questions coming to that NCD topic we were talking about. Mm -hmm. Right, This no claim discount mm -hmm. or no claim bonus or whatever it's called. Is we as a motorist who own a vehicle, you oftentimes say I want to protect this NCD. I don't want to lose it because it takes me five years to build 50%. And just the first shunt and I lose two years' work, right? To get 30%. Then I've seen in the marketplace that oftentimes there are these options where you say, hey, you can take an NCD protector. So you're you're good. I'm gonna make sure you don't lose this hard-earned discount. Can you tell me, is there any truth to something like this? So there are a few variants of this. It all started with NCD protector. Then I think there was a NCD for life. And then there was 60% NCD. And last I heard, the 65 or 70% NCD. Go for it, go for it. Yeah. That's it's good. All, the sky's the limit. Why not, right? <laughs> I uh, 110%. Yeah, exactly. You, you pay me money for yeah. insuring a few. Um, there's a caveat of there's a fine print that's not uh, commonly communicated to the consumer. The keyword here is that all these variants are not transferable. So what does this mean? This means that this is only applicable if you stay with the same insurer. So assume that you are with insurer A and you have an NCD protector or NCD for life. Or I'm 60. NCD 75, man. Yeah. yeah let's oh. go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll sell you 80. <laughs> yeah, okay. So yeah. the moment you have an accident, they tell you, all right, um, your 50% is supposed to go to 30. But on renewal, if you stay with us, we give you 50. Now, again, what do we mean by NCD is not uh, protection is not transferable? The caveat is if you choose on renewal to go to another insurer, you'll only be 20. So the other insurer say, no, you had an accident, your NCD is 20. But if you stay with a steam insurer, it's 50. However, I, I think this is what uh, they don't convey to consumers also. When you look at the fine print of an insurance policy, you realize one thing. There's nothing governing how much they can charge you for your insurance, your base premium. So the premium before we talk about these discounts. That's right. Okay. The 50% NCD is a discount on your premium. So let's take an example of the first year you're paying $1,000 uh, for your premium after 50%. So it was $2,000. Yes. But with 50%, you're paying $1,000. You had a really, really bad accident. The insurer just had a... It's a write-off. Wow. Okay. I don't <laughs> know what you do. I don't yeah. know what you're doing with the car, but... Because uh, uh, I'm young and unmarried. <laughs> okay. Well, I, will, I, will, I will charge you a high premium. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now... So after the accident, um, they say, hey, you have 50, uh, NCD protector. So great. Well, here's your renewal premium on 50%. Your $1,000 premium just went up to $5,000 because of the, you had a back accident. So I'm sorry, we have to charge. But it's on 50%. So if it wasn't 50, we'll charge you 10,000, 10, right? Okay. Now, now what happens here? You know, there's a few cases where I had customers who were on insurer A and they now have to pay 5,000. They come to me and say, Doug, what can you do? I have an NCD protector. Can you get me uh, shop for a cheaper one? Yeah, source around for cheaper. Well, I said, look, I, there's not much I can do. You know, the NCD is not transferable. It's all, it, the NCD protector, which by the way, most NCD protector, the cost of an NCD protector is about 12%. So you actually pay 12% more on your premium to buy NCD protector. Then what happens is I, w I went out and sourced for uh, alternative quotes for my customer. Um, and we came back with a few quotations and we say, okay, look, I have insurer B for you. Um, unfortunately, I can only give you 20% NCD, but the premium is $4,000. So cheaper than your 5,000, right? So I'm so with 20% NCD, you could get a lower premium. This is the case here. Yes. Okay. So he, he with, with his existing provider, he had to pay $5,000 on 50% NCD or let's say 50% discount. I offer him an alternative 
20% NCD, but $4,000. Now, it's, it's more than once. I have customers saying, you know what? I think I'll stick with paying $5,000 instead of the $4,000 offer that you have. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing the emotional attachment people attach to this 50%. Yeah, 50% tells everyone that I'm a really responsible person. Yeah, Can but you even, after, uh, even after you had an accident... That they... was not my fault. The tree jumped in front of me. Okay, I'm trying. Um, <laughs> no, the, 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 I'm Joe. <laughs> I have so many cases where the customer said, it's not my fault. The car in front of me jam braked. <laughs> wouldn't happen if you weren't feeling so close. I didn't say that. You say that. <laughs> so now, the, the NCD protection... It's a stroke of brilliance by the person who created NCD protection because yeah. first, they make you cough up another 10 to 12% premium yes. to buy this thing. That offers you no real protection other than give you the illusion that, or, 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 that if you stay with them, you keep this 50%. However, I think most people are just happy to be penalized. Well, deluded into thinking <laughs> that as long as I have 50%, yeah. It doesn't exactly, like you said, penalize. I don't mind how much I'm being, I, I'm paying. So they're willing to pay more just to keep their 50%. So there's no real protection from NCD protector, NCD for life or NC6 because the moment you have an accident, you are beholden to them. Okay. But also this at this point, I just to clarify that NCD itself is recognized by all the insurers, right? So if I have 50% and this is accrued over with company, I've been very loyal to them, I build to 50, I bring it to insurer B, you will, the insurer B will still honour this 50%. NCD is transferable. NCD protection and its variants such as NCD for life, 60% NCD, it's not uh, as, uh, transferable. So only up to 50% NCD, the normal or so what we deem as the normal NCD, are transferable and universally recognised by all insurers in Singapore. Ah, okay, okay. Because that, that's important differentiation because this, this extra, this new newer product is really specific to the individual insurer. Yes. Okay. I want to touch on something else that have been like really bugging me a little bit. But I think it's, this is time probably we want to have a quick break. But just as a teaser, I'm thinking about the issue of insurance for people who don't own a car. For those who are getting into car sharing arrangements, I mean... You know, we hear of really scary amounts that you have to pay in compensation for what seems like a very light shunt. Are you ready? Let's come back after the break. Sure. Find us on Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or via the Google Voice Assistant and Amazon Alexa-enabled devices. And now back to our podcast episode. So before we had our quick break, we were talking about the use, or rather the users of these car sharing or car rental schemes being faced with a big bill when they get into an accident, whether it's because of their own doing or it's somebody else who caused the accident. Now, I just want to get from uh, industry insight to how do these car rental companies come to bring out such, such a scheme? I mean, like, you know, that you have to pay so much high excess, right? What, what is, what's the deal? Well, I think, Nemjo, first you have to understand is the risk profile of such um, car sharing is bad. So from an insurance perspective, imagine you are renting a car for an hour or a day. So the people are not used to the car, you know, how it handles or, or etc. Et or they, are not, they might not even be experienced drivers. So the probability of them getting in an accident is higher than a person who owns his car and drives the car every day. He knows the ins and outs of it. So the, law, the loss history or the claims ratio of such uh, portfolios are historically bad, which is why the insurance premium for such cars are high. Now, who bears the cost for such insurance premium? It's the car sharing companies. Now, imagine you're a car sharing company with a fleet of a thousand, right? The insurance premium for such cars could go into the hundreds of thousands, if not even millions. Now, that's a very hefty cost. So how do you bring this cost down? Now, even for the large car sharing companies, cost is a big concern. You know, they have to think of every way to try and bring the cost down. One way, you know, it's just like when you buy medical insurance, one option for you to get cheaper medical insurance is up the, uh, the, uh, the co- co-insurance or the deductible. This is the same theory that applies for excess. If you increase the excess, right, and your premium potentially come down because you are risk sharing. Now, 
this applies very well for people who are owning the individual cars because I goes in with my I go in with my eyes open and I say, hey, you know what? I'm I'm willing to take a lower premium, and uh, I am uh, 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 taking bearing a higher proportion of risk. But in this case of the car sharing, is is the car sharing company who has decided that hey, you know, I'm going to just make my consumers bear a large part of the risk. So when when you rent a car from these car sharing companies, the insurance cost is priced in. Right, and they'll just say, "Look, this is the excess, and you have the bad excess." They write in your contract, and in most cases of such car sharing companies, there are two layers of excess. Now, for your personal car, your excess is one thousand, for example. Now, what this one thousand means is we don't actually call it um, section one or section two; we just call it excess. But it's actually a section one excess, which means that the excess that applies for you when you pay for the repairs of your car. But for the car sharing companies, there's two la- la- uh, layers of excess. Section one, which is the amount that you pay for the repair of the car. And section two, which is the amount you pay for third-party damages, be it a human or a car. So it's, in a way, the excess is double. Usually the excesses are higher. Private cars excess for normal cars usually range between 600 to 1,000. Car sharing excess would uh, normally starts at around 3,000 for each section. So 3,000 on section one. And three thousand. So that brings it about six thousand dollars. That's right. Of exposure for a person who rents a car, in unfortunately get in an accident. Yes. And this will all be expressed in the fine print, right? Oh yes, the keyword is fine print. It will it will be in the fine okay, print. Okay, in the bold print. Then it, I mean, it'll be in the contract to be to be more serious. Yeah. It will be. So uh, unfortunately for consumers, it, it's kind of take it or leave it in their regard. Um, it is not. Impossible, but I think it's uncommon. So if you think about it this way, if you are renting a car overseas like Hertz or Budget or Avis, uh, there's something called the collision damage waiver. Yes. Right? You can, that's what it means to buy down your excess. Hmm. So if, uh, usually if you go to Europe, the excess is, I don't know, 2,000 euros uh, and you can buy down to like 200 euros and just by buying this down. That's usually not an option in Singapore for, for this uh, uh, car sharing fleets because this industry is pretty nascent still and I don't think it is as robust as for you to be able to buy down your excess as yet. I think this collision damage waiver, this CDW, I have seen it uh, being dangled for, for some uh, uh, of these car rental services already. Yes. Right? I mean, it's common. Yeah, this is between uh, uh, not just the ones that are for long term leasing, whether you're using it for, for work or for the short term leasing that goes down to the hour. Mm-hmm. But let's say, let's put all that aside. I'd like to find out what happens when you actually get into an accident. Because oftentimes, you hear of stories where the insurer comes back, oh, your claim for this damage. I mean, it looks to me pretty simple. It's like half a bumper. It wasn't from the Rolls Royce that we were, we were using as an example. It's just a regular car. This accident that looks, in my eyes, untrained eyes, a few hundred dollars, comes back and this is a ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 claim. What is going on with this insurance process of repairing and putting, putting things back in order? So before I answer that question, I think I need to emphasize that it's very important to note that how much you claim for uh, insurance will affect your insurance premium on renewal. So it's actually in your interest to minimize the claim because the higher you claim you know, on renewal, your insurance premium is going to go up, a la what we mentioned uh, about the NCD protector yes. earlier. Now, that's why it's important to have a contact for insurance reporting, either your insurance agent or insurance broker, or your workshop that you're, you, you're familiar with. So one of these three, right? Because we, we strongly encourage um, liaising with somebody you know and you trust and knows about either the car, the repairs of the car, or insurance to help you with it. On the point of um, the exorbitant claim that you mentioned earlier, I think in recent media, uh, we have heard some cases where people have gotten in an accident along the highway and uh, there will be friendly people who will come down to help them on the spot. And, and a tow truck is just on standby conveniently. Now, um, that goes back to the point where I say it is very important that when you have an accident, contact someone you know in insurance or in workshop repairs. Do your insurance reporting and your repairs with that individual and not some stranger that you meet on the highway. That is literally the worst thing you can do. Now, if you find someone that approaches you on the highway, they say, hey, I'm here to help. I have a tow truck. Now, I understand sometimes it's raining, you're in a rush, there's a jam, and you just want to get something sorted. It's, it's tempting to, 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 to take that help, but uh, I would really caution against it. Um, there have been horror stories. They might ask you to sign a letter undertaking for them to be empowered to help you. 
handle the whole handle thing? Handle the whole process, right? The claims, the repairs and everything. Now, the next thing some of our customers have found out is that once they've done that, they got a, they, they realize that their, their, ins- their bill for their own repair and the third party cost was an ob- like, for a fender bender added up to be tens of thousands of dollars. Now, this has huge implication for them on their insurance renewal, right? And they wouldn't wear at that point in time, which is why it is always important to go to a trusted workshop or contact your insurance provider or intermediary. Yeah, so the whole point is that not just the convenience of it. I just, I mean, it's never a good experience when your car is in, you know, a bad state, but you just want it back. But the advice here is don't do that. Don't go for the convenient thing. Don't go for the convenient call thing. Call a friend. You know, as, <laughs> call a friend. Uh, exactly. Yes, call a friend. Call your insurance broker. Call your workshop. Call your car dealer if you have ah, to. Yes. Right? Okay. That you should have some contact point with the person you buy the car from or the person you buy the insurance from, or the workshop that you frequent. Go to one of these three. Do not go to the stranger. This good, the good Samaritan, come on. The good on. Samaritan. The yeah. good Samaritan that you meet. A uh, healthy dose of skepticism here. All right. <laughs> right. I want to ask another thing, which is the cost of renewal, we already established that it will always go up because of inflation, because of all these other concerns. But what about also the different kinds of cars that are out there today? I mean, one of the, the hot topics we've been persuaded influence, incentivize to consider going electric. An electric vehicle today is the coolest toy you can buy off a dealership. What is the reality for insurance from buying an insurance? What is the, the, the premiums like? And I want to know, are they like more expensive to repair? And does that mean that, you know, coming back, I'm going to pay more all the way, just snowballing? Um, on EV, I think as with all new technology, uh, the pricing would be a little bit more expensive. The critical mass is not there yet. Uh, again, as I mentioned earlier, insurance is about risk pooling. The more you have, the cheaper the price gets brought down. As we know, the take up of EVs in the last couple of years has uh, exponentially increased. However, it still forms the minority of the population of Singapore. I know that, you know, this year we had what 13% of EV sales. Yeah, and they're split among so many brands. So yes. I guess your point about the models in circulation, yes. more popular, lower premium. So that's one factor. Another factor is um, the cost of repair. So you, I, I think um, you pointed out earlier and you're right in that the cost of repair for EV so far is still more expensive than uh, traditional uh, combustion engine cars. And the reason why is uh, one is, well, it's new technology. As you know, battery technology is going to get cheaper and cheaper, but it's still expensive. Over time, as uh, the technology improves, it will get cheaper and cheaper but it's still costlier than what it will cost to repair a combustion engine. One main component that contributes to this cost is the car battery. Now, think of the car battery as the car engine. If you damage the car battery, you have to change the car battery. It's new. I think um, the occurrence of accidents are not high enough to have an accurate size. Um, The technology scale is not uh, there yet to bring down costs. But I have no doubt um, EV EV population is increasing, technology is getting better, and I would say not even uh, uh, week by week, but day by day, we do see EV premiums coming lower. That being said, uh, EV premiums are not that significantly higher than normal cars. Uh, At most, 20% uh, higher, more expensive. But we do see that it's... In a, in a matter of a year or so, we do, we, there should be parity between the ICE engine and the EV engine premiums. Hmm, so you're forecasting about a year or so, we're going to be paying the same whether you're ICE or uh, EV. But, but just not this, this thing about this 20% extra, the premium you need to pay for an EV. This is on assuming a similar arrangement for your insurance excess. Uh, yes, uh, good point. Excess is definitely higher. I would say excess for... Normal Japanese cars are about 600. EVs tend to be about 1,000. Wow, that's that's significant. That's 50% yes. more? Almost. Okay. Because this this coming back to uh, uh, us shopping for as a consumer, as a vehicle owner, shopping for insurance. I mean, of course, you, you, you come from the side of a business that shops for customers. You say that you are taking the customer's side. I mean, we live in an age when everything can be done with a few keystrokes. Right, I could search, I could shop online. I mean, not Amazon it, but you know the the pretty much the effect. What other value does 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 a insurance broker bring on board that you know if I can get a cheaper insurance from an online only provider, for example? I think the difference of uh, for us or the value proposition we bring is as a broker is we help you do the shopping. 
Till date, there is no aggregator online for that allows you to compare against multiple insurer. I'm happy to share that we are building one at the moment. We hope to launch it next year. Now, as a consumer, you probably would have to go to all the individual insurer to do the comparison. And even then, they have different T's and C's. And you have to read the fine print. You don't actually, actually have to spend the time to navigate and understand the differences. And sometimes you might even miss out the differences. So I think our value proposition or our, our advantage is that we do all this for you. When you come to us and you tell us your need, what we can do is we will, we will search the market for you. And because we actually have internal systems where we have connectivity to all the insurance companies and we're able to get the pricing. We present all the comparison for you in a, a, a table format. So you can, you can assess for yourself which is the best product for you. So that saves you time and the trouble. Okay. So I mean, the, in that table that you're talking about, we're talking about the features of the policy, right? Yes. We'll compare against insurer A, B, and C, their premium, their access, their coverage, everything. Yeah, Because I mean, the other one, and I think I want to, we're well, kind of increasingly something in terms of features you can take out of, you can strip out of, a, of an insurance policy when you do shopping for, for whether it's for medical or for motor insurance. And this topic about driving to Malaysia, mm -hmm. I think the, this is a, if going by the kind of con congestion we see and the land checkpoints, we know a lot of people are doing that. What is your experience when it comes to driving in Malaysia, when it comes to having an accident, unfortunately, or an accident happening to you, whichever way you want to frame it, just... Yeah, is it something that we are there things we can do to mitigate the risk? Uh, I I think rather than mitigate, I think one thing, um, if and when you have accident in Malaysia, there's one important note that you have to take note of: always make a police report. It is a prerequisite or requirement for making an insurance claim. So after you have an accident, please do make a police report at a nearest police station over there. Now, as per usual, get the particulars of the other driver, the the ID and the plate number. So. What I can advise is uh, uh, the best of what I would call the best of a worst scenario because when you have an accident with a, a car in Malaysia who is insured by a Malaysia insurer, there's no cross-border agreement between Singapore and Malaysia for insurance. I always say that when you get hit by a Malaysian car, be it in Singapore or in Malaysia, it's like being hit by a drunk driver. You have to use your own insurance because even though the other person is at fault, you most likely can't claim against the other insurance body. It's the same when someone is drunk driving. The moment you do something illegal like drunk driving, you void your insurance policy. That insurance of the other person will not cover. So that's why you buy insurance for unforeseen circumstances. So you can claim your own insurance too. One point to highlight to note is that um, if you claim your insurance under cases like act of God, so if a tree falls down on your car, or if you're hit by a drunken driver, so the drunken driver is at fault, and you actually do an own damage claim, it is possible to negotiate with your insurer not to affect your NCD and not to have premium loading on renewal. So most people don't know this um, and uh, because it's not your fault. So you can tell them, look, this is a really one in a million, but it does happen. Uh, we have helped a lot of our customers negotiate with, with the insurer and they don't affect the NCD and they don't affect the but insurance. This is interesting. Does the insurance company put up a fight? No, they don't. They're actually quite understanding. They say, look, we understand a tree fell down. You were parked at the parking lot. A tree fell down because there was a big storm. It's, it's an act of God. It's not your fault. We'll pay the claim. You keep your NCD. We do not load you. You got hit by a drunken driver from behind. You got hit by a Malaysian car who was at fault. All these scenarios where you have no recourse against the other party, it's possible to uh, negotiate with the insurer. Right. So, Douglas, let me just, just, just clarify this. So, you're saying that as long as a tree fell on my, on my car and it's not to, on my own doing, or the person that got in an accident with me is drunk, then there's possibility for me to not just make the claim for damage from the insurance, my own insurance, repair my car, but I can also negotiate that the insurer will understand and will not affect my NCD. Yes, that's right. It's insurance specific, but it is possible and we have many successful cases. What if? What if? What if it's the other party that caused the accident or I caused the accident, but he did not report. Because ah. I understand that by policy, you have to report within the stipulated hours of the next working day or something. Otherwise, the insurance is not going to cover me. Yes, it is an insurance condition that when you have an accident, you're supposed to report within 24 hours. Um, what you have just described is a very interesting point and it's a very bizarre zone that um, happens from time to time. If you got in an accident with someone, let's say someone hit you and you did, you've done your reporting, you want to claim yeah, so you're, my part. Yeah, you're trying to claim against the other party but then a couple of weeks later you get an email saying hey the insurer tells you my insured did not do the reporting so 
hey, tough luck. We're not, we're not going to entertain or we're not going to be activated. So please go and sue him yourself. So if the other person doesn't do the reporting, his insurance will void coverage for that because he has, he has void the, insur- the conditions of his insurance. So the insurance, co- uh, the insurance company will not cover him. So the, when the insurance company will say, you have to go after him yourself. Now, this is also a tricky part because look, usually in such cases, maybe the damage to your car is $2,000. And uh, are you really going to hire a, a lawyer? lawyer? Yeah. And you know, the time, the effort, and maybe pay $5,000 to go after the guy. So most times you just say, look, uh, forget about it. Um, I'll just claim my own insurance. So you claim OD. So you make a claim on your own insurance. Uh, under normal circumstances, again, it affects your insurance. You lose your ad- So anytime you make your own claim, you lose your NCD, yes. there's a uh, possibility of premium loading. But however, again, similar to what we've discussed, if you can prove to your insurer that it's not your fault, but it is really out of uh, 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 no recourse, many a times, again, you can be negotiated with the insurer not to penalize your NCD and not to increase your premium on renewal. So not increasing your insurance on renewal, but then my cost base would have gone up, wouldn't it? No, that means not increasing means not even increasing your cost base because you did not make a claim because it was your fault. Now, insurance company penal, well, I would say increase your premium or load your premium because you were at fault, because you, you, you were culpable in causing an accident. They should not, in theory, penalize you if you did not cause the accident. Now, they can say that on the T's and C, yes, they reserve the right to, but I think they are a little bit human in that aspect. They say, look, we understand if you did not cause the accident, we, tr- we, will, we will try our best to understand and not penalize you. Wow. Thank you. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure anyone else know that trick of the trade, but this is a really, really useful piece of uh, knowledge that we learned today. The, the caveat is, is insurance, uh, insurer specific. Not all insurers practice that. Uh, we generally work with insurers who are more understanding, but I, I don't guarantee that this works for everybody, but uh, we, we have high success rate thus far. Sure, as long as it means that there is, a, it's worth a try. It's worth a try. It's worth a try. Okay, thank you so much, Douglas, for your time. Oh, thanks, Namjo. Well, that's a wrap for Siri Watch, a podcast by The Straits Times. I'm your host, Lee Nian Jo. If you resonate with the points raised, do share this podcast episode with your friends and family. If you'd like to read more of my transport articles, there's a link in the podcast show notes. Thanks for listening. <laughs>